Dear uh, Maros, uh, dear uh, uh, students, I think Maros, you have also your <gasps> former colleague here. <laughs> Hello, hello. <laughs> He's one of no, our best teachers here. Now my nervosity yeah. level is getting up. <laughs> <enough. Yeah. laughs> He's here exactly to, to give an evaluation at the end. <laughs> so uh, it's a great opportunity for us to have you here uh, for many reasons. You are a friend. You are a friend of Sciences Po. But also because you are doing a fantastic job in Brussels, uh, trying to... Uh, uh, have the success of this energy union that is one of the most important uh, missions of, uh, of the European Union in this very period of difficulties, of troubles in uh, the European political life, in the European landscape. We need successors and you are one of the possible successors. So this is why uh, we support you, your uh, uh, work on the energy union. But also you have here the students of the master uh, in international energy. Giacomo Luciani is our big boss. Uh, he's another Italian, so sorry. <laughs> uh, but we have a Spanish teacher now, so it's... <laughs> uh, and uh, we are very proud of this uh, master because the master in international energy is real, uh, really one of the uh, most uh, successful uh, offers that Sciences Po and, and PSIA under the leadership of uh, Vanessa Scherer and my predecessor Hassan Salameh uh, succeeded. Uh, today, I think for, for us is a great opportunity to have uh, uh, Vice President Sefcovic for many reasons. Uh, in these very days, there are a lot of things happening in Brussels on these issues. But also for us it's very interesting to know the perspective, to know what is the medium and long term uh, uh, ideas that you have and, and also your feeling about the possibilities to, uh, to, to get the result at the end of this uh, uh, period. Uh, as I told you before, Sciences Po is really very open to any cooperation with the Commission for many reasons, uh, the possibility to send uh, students in stage or other opportunities. Here you have the Paris School of International Affairs and you have, first of all, the uh, Master in, uh, also in uh, European Affairs, the Center of European Affairs, so it's a, a big, big challenge for us to work on these issues and to put together the European mood and also the global uh, picture, and the global picture that is so uh, important. So uh, we are here to hear you. Uh, Giacomo will uh, chair and will uh, organize the discussion. Uh, I would like also to thank the association, the students, because the students were really the reason why we organized this meeting. They uh, knew that you were here and they immediately organized and they, uh, for us it's a really great opportunity. So thank you for being here and uh, you are the floor. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much. If I speak like this, can you hear me? Or we will try yeah, to no, do it no, like it's this. A, it's okay. If you leave it here, it's perfect. Be okay. Yeah. Oh, I'll try to speak up. So, at first, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Enrico, dear Dean, but also dear Giacomo, uh, Vanessa, dear Dominic, the organizer of the Students Association, and uh, very nice surprise, dear Joaquin. You know, because in the college it's a little bit like in the school. You always talk the most to your neighbor, and uh, Joaquin was my neighbor for five years. Uh, at the college table, so we've been gossiping a lot, you know, <laughs> commenting on other colleagues, you know, <laughs> assessing if the president is right or not. And uh, he was, he was, of course, not only the great commissioner, vice president, but also a great friend. And I'm very happy that uh, he is now uh, with you here today. The first thing I would like to start with the good news. You are in a great school. You have uh, great uh, teachers, because I, I know uh, your dean, I, I, I know some of your professors, and, and we had the, the, the privilege uh, to work with many of your students, be it as uh, stagiaires or uh, be it at our full-time uh, colleagues. And therefore, of course, when we 
received the invitation to the science ball, definitely the members of my cabinet who studied at this school make absolutely sure that I have to come. So they, <laughs> so they think about uh, they, they, they alma mater and it's always a pleasure to be here because I don't know what kind of tactics they used, what kind of threats you are under, but it's always a lot of students coming to this lecture, so I very much, uh, I very much uh, appreciate it. But the truth is that uh, your university really uh, become uh, over the years such a real laboratory, real test case for multidisciplinary uh, studies, uh, for cross-fertilization of the ideas. And I was told that you are here, the students from 40 different countries from uh, all over the globe. And I think it's uh, very unique for you to know each other a little bit better. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very unique and I'm sure very challenging for the professors to answer to your question and to get uh, angles of uh, all your suggestions because you are bringing this experience and you are bringing, uh, you, uh, you are bringing your, your cultural heritage and your perspective uh, uh, to the classroom and, and to the school and it's always uh, extremely, extremely helpful. And uh, discussing today, I know that you are specializing in, in the energy and uh, today, of course, uh, in the energy world is uh, going uh, 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 very dynamic uh, development. Uh, and I will try to share with you at least some uh, information about what we are doing in Europe about the energy union, where we are heading, as I understood also the last question of uh, Enrico, where we think we managed to push the process by the end uh, of this legislature. And then, of course, I'm very much looking forward uh, to your question. <coughs> The paradox in Europe is that uh, 200 uh, uh, years ago uh, we started in Europe the first uh, industrial revolution. And today we are discussing if we are in the third or the fourth industrial revolution. And I know that you are very good students, so you would remember that all, all the time when we've been talking about this leap forward, about uh, um, about the event which we can describe as an industrial revolution, that you have to have such a proper constellation of the stars, or better to say, of three different phenomena. You have to have breakthrough technologies in energy, in transport, and in the communication. So for, what, so for Brits, it was coal, steam engine, and printed press. Later on, it was oil, new mobility, thanks to the, to the car industry, and phone, and the TV later on. And today we are, of course, uh, uh, digitalizing the, our life. We are working on totally different platforms. We have new types of energy. We have completely new way how we communicate uh, with each other. And we, of course, are uh, very much developing new types uh, of transport. So the discussion among the thinkers is, are we now in the third or the fourth industrial revolution? And Professor Schwab, whom I met uh, uh, in our meeting in Davos is a strong supporter of the fact that we are in the fourth industrial evolution because uh, the characteristics which is new in this century is the velocity, is the pace, it's a dynamics with, all, uh, with, with what all these changes are, are taking place. And that's, I think, the, one of the reasons why we are still trying to adjust our new economic models. Each company has to change their the, the business model. The distributors are more and more in trouble to find a way uh, how they can manage uh, in the time where if you are a music producer, you do not need a distribution company anymore because you can put it on the internet. If you are selling books or newspapers, you know it very well that uh, how often you go to the bookshop to look for the books before then you check it on the, on the internet. And of course it applies in the same way to tourism industry, to how we sell the air tickets, how we organize the logistics, and of course how we sell the energy. So therefore each industry. Each sector is going through this uh, very uh, new and uh, challenging, uh, challenging period. But the paradox is that with all that uh, modernization, with all the development, we still in Europe cannot say that we have 100% secure supply of energy. That we know that whatever happens, the supply of energy in uh, Europe uh, would be guaranteed. At the same time, with all that new technology, we cannot say that our energy sector is environmentally friendly that we can actually power our economy without harming uh, the uh, environment. And uh, if um, I am crisscrossing the Europe, and especially if you are in Central and Eastern Europe, and you start to talk about the gas, the first question is if we would have another gas crisis, if we would have the repetition of 2006 or 2009. 
where many of these countries have uh, been, uh, been really forced to stop the whole industry because they didn't, get, they didn't get enough of the energy. So despite all that modernizing fact, despite, despite the, 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 the 200 years of industrial development, we are still struggling with uh, this situation. And in Europe, it's even more paradoxical because you would remember that uh, Europe was founded as a, uh, as a steel and coal community. So energy and sharing of the assets was at the birth of the European project. That, uh, that these great leaders of Europe decided that after the Second World War, we need to share the assets. We need to share what was, in their eyes, the most important at that time, the, the energy, uh, and uh, the, such an important mean of, of, of production like steel to make sure that uh, the countries would cooperate, so they would integrate the, the, the effort and, and that they will build the further cooperation around this. And today we can say that the project was very successful, that we, have, we had no war in Europe since the steel and coal community was founded, that we learned how to share our assets, that we benefit a lot from creating the, the, the largest integrated uh, economy in the world. And then we introduced in our Europe actually the free, free movement of, of persons, free movement uh, of goods and services, but we still don't have the free movement of energies. And uh, it's uh, already some time since we introduced the concept of uh, single market. It's already since some time then we introduced the internal energy market concept. But today, if we want to be honest with each other, so we still have to, to, to claim that if it comes to the energy, we have more 28 national markets for energy than one single energy market. And of course, uh, 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 and of course uh, because of that, uh, we are uh, suffering in Europe with uh, higher energy prices, with the less of the energy uh, security, and uh, with uh, lots of uh, volatility, which we are very often facing in the energy sector. That was one of the uh, reasons uh, why the energy and energy union uh, idea was already floating around uh, for some time. But I think that it took us, uh, as, uh, it, we had to have two very important uh, evolutions to make the energy union one of the most important projects that Europe has right now. The first one was uh, the importance of our climate policies and the clear need of better coordination and, and cooperation among the European member states to make sure that Europe will play this positive leading role in fighting against the climate change. Second thing was uh, still this pertaining uh, worry about uh, the supply of energy which was exacerbated by the, the geopolitical tensions which we can witness until today in the east uh, of Ukraine. And therefore, uh, the decision was taken and the new president of the European Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, was very tough in making sure that we would streamline our priorities, that we would focus on the t on 10 key areas where energy union and digital single market being taken as a two projects which should usher the European economy into the 21st century. And then of course we started to work on the project team. What would be the best? What kind of team do we need so we can deliver on this energy uh, union project? And I think we discovered uh, very quickly that you cannot discuss the energy without climate policies that you cannot discuss greenhouse gas uh, reductions uh, without having transport commissioner and agriculture commission on board. That it's quite clear that if you want to have a progress in energy efficiency, uh, you have to deal with your building stock in Europe, which is outdated and which consumes more than 50% of our energy consumption. And of course, if you want to make sure that we would be prepared for the 21st century, we would never achieve that without new breakthroughs in the technologies, with the research, innovation, and with all that uh, support we would need from uh, new creative companies, and they would not achieve it if we would not support our scientific and research community with uh, the proper framework and proper financial support. Therefore, we introduce these five dimensions of the energy union. Security of supply, completion of the internal energy market, uh, 
uh, moderation of the demand, uh, decarbonization of our economy, and support for research and innovation. How to do it in practical terms? You need to have uh, good teams. You need to have the DGs working, working together. And uh, when I was uh, putting this uh, uh, composition on the paper, we quickly realized that we need 14 commissioners and 16 DGs to work together. Because except to these uh, major priorities I mentioned, you need to have a good cooperation with the commissioner responsible for trade. Here we are, we are importer. We need to have a good trade relations with all uh, uh, energy exporting nations. You need to be in a good terms and have close cooperation with the competition, with the, with the competition commissioner. Uh, uh, Vice President Almunia remembers very well what kind of subsidies we are offering to energy sectors and how the competition uh, in the internal energy market is uh, important. If you want to support energy efficiency, of course you need uh, to work very closely with the commissioner who is responsible for structural funds in Europe, because this is very often the first and primary source of uh, refurbishing of uh, outdated buildings uh, in Europe. And I can go on and on. Uh, but uh, what is, I think, very important uh, that uh, we, uh, I think, have a very good start of this project, that this idea was uh, positively perceived uh, when I travel across the Europe uh, on so-called energy union tour. What I feel is uh, that uh, the European citizens have uh, posi positive attitudes toward this project because everybody is somehow affected. Be it uh, somebody who pays the bill for the households or somebody who works for the SMEs or, uh, or the workers who are working in energy intensive factories who are simply worried if the energy would be so high and if uh, the carbon tax uh, would be imposed, what would it mean with the steelworks, what would it mean with the refineries, uh, or if you are from renewables industry, how the low energy prices would affect uh, the development of these new renewables uh, technologies on the European market. You have, of course, different accents across the Europe. If you talk to Nordic countries, there you would feel that they are very much uh, interested in the promotion of renewables. If you would talk to Central and Eastern Europeans, they're still very much worried about the, the security of supply and about the energy prices. If you, go, if you talk to Southerners, they just want to uh, make sure that they are much better interconnected uh, with their continental partners than before, because only in that case uh, they can, uh, they can uh, benefit uh, from uh, the uh, European uh, internal uh, European <coughs> internal market, and uh, therefore I think that we have to use this momentum because there is still a lot to do if it comes to if it comes uh, in the, to, to the field of the uh, energy and uh, climate. Tomorrow we are going to present uh, the first package of this year, which I described as a year of delivery because I promise that by the end of this year we will deliver 90% uh, of what we promised we would do under the Energy Union umbrella. Tomorrow we are going to deliver the security of supply package which consists uh, of a uh, revised directive on, uh, on the gas supplies where we want to make sure that the solidarity principle from Lisbon Treaty is operationalized and that the countries would be ready to help each other in the case of crisis, meaning that we want to motivate the member states to prepare the contingency plans, not only for themselves, but for the, for the, for the, for the whole regions. Meaning if the problem is um, in my country, neighboring countries should help the protected customer in, in my country to make sure that we would have uh, this level playing field also in the, in the time of crisis. We are introducing new LNG strategy tomorrow because we know that within the next five years we will have uh, more than 50% uh, of uh, global uh, supplies added to the current uh, international gas portfolio coming from the LNGs from uh, such a reliable partners like United States, Canada and Australia. And I think that uh, Europe should benefit from this new global development. Uh, we are going to present tomorrow also heating and cooling strategy because we know that uh, the cleanest and cheapest energy is that one which is saved. And as I said, in the sector we consume more than 50% of energy and therefore I think it goes very well together to show that we want to diversify, but at the same time we want to save the energy. And the last uh, piece which we will propose today would uh, concern the intergovernmental agreements where we want to introduce more transparency into how these agreements are negotiated and agreed to make sure that before 
they are ratified by the national parliaments, uh, uh, that they are compatible with the EU law, so we would avoid all the problems we had in the past with the governments which have been ratified, approved, and then we discover that they are not uh, in uh, accordance with the European law with all the legal, political, and other uh, problems uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, imagine. And we would, uh, of course, uh, uh, highlight the fact that uh, this should help us also to continue to lower the differences we still have, uh, unfortunately, between, uh, uh, between uh, Central, Eastern Europe and uh, the Western European countries. Because we looked at what have been the prices over the last uh, few years. Just let's take last uh, two years. In 2014, the Central and Eastern in European member states have been still paying 24% more for the gas supplies than the Western European uh, partners. Last year, the difference was still 16%. Why it is so? Because the Western markets are much more liquid and there is less dominant position of dominant suppliers. So we have, uh, they are much better interconnected, they have more choice and this is something what we need to achieve for every member state. So we hope that uh, once uh, these strategies are uh, put in place, that each member state uh, would have access to at least three different sources of gas and each member state would have access to LNG terminal. Why the LNG is important? Just one example. When Lithuania opened the LNG terminal in Klaipeda, next week they got a discount on the price of 20%. So that's what diversification do, that's what competition can do for Europe, and that's what we are trying to do for the whole European Union. We would be working on uh, uh, diversification with a lot of energy. We want to see new Caspian gas uh, in Europe before the end of this decade. We are very hopeful about uh, the positive uh, developments on Cyprus, and there is a real chance to achieve uh, long-lasting peace and uh, reunite uh, the, the island uh, with the positive, uh, 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 positive uh, consequences for the whole region, which is now becoming very important from the energy point of view because of the new gas field discoveries, uh, not only close to Cyprus, but also Israel and uh, Egypt. So we want to make sure that uh, Europe will be on uh, uh, the energy map uh, as a, not only as a biggest uh, energy important, uh, importer, which we are right now, the continent which pays more than one billion US dollar or euros, I can say also, per, per day for energy imports, but also as a very important uh, uh, partner if it comes uh, to the green policies, if it comes to the climate policy, and if it comes to the development of uh, energy uh, efficiency technologies. Why is it important? Because uh, Europe was for quite some time lonely leader in the fight against uh, climate change. And uh, we are the only major economy which managed so-called decoupling. That since 1990, European economy grew by 46%, and we managed to lower our greenhouse gas emission by 24%. We are the only continent which, uh, which uh, achieved that. Of course, it required a lot of efforts. We learned a lot uh, in this process. Of course, we made uh, some mistake, but I believe that the technologies we developed, the political experience we've gathered, should be now used, and we are offering it to our international par partners, because every single economy would have to do the same what we did in Europe. If you want to achieve the goals which we all agreed uh, in Paris in December, every single country would have to go through this transition. Every single country would uh, uh, need uh, to, to, to learn from this experience to develop the, the, the technologies we developed in Europe. And I see there a great opportunity, not only from the point of view of uh, or helping the planet, but also for the European technologies to be proposed, to be offered to our international partners, because uh, uh, the rough estimate, how much would it cost uh, to achieve the, uh, the, the global climate change uh, in uh, next decades is a very huge sum. It's around 13.5 trillion US dollars. This is what uh, uh, would be needed to make sure that our global energy systems are transformed and uh, adjusted uh, to, uh, the, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the climate change. Um, as you see, I'm reading now very quickly because I know that you would like to, to, to ask me uh, some questions. 
So maybe the last uh, 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 two comments on how we want to make sure that uh, these European ideas, that energy union will, will come to the member states. Because uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, you know that there is such a popular saying that what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. <laughs> And my impression is that uh, very often what happens in Brussels stays in Brussels. And I know uh, that uh, many of colleagues of mine will tell me, and that's good. <laughs> but in this particular case, I really think that we need uh, to make sure that uh, the energy union is built. And I know that the energy union could be built only in our member states, in our cities, in our industry. And uh, we need to make sure that these ideas are transferred. Uh, transfer to our member states, and that member states also do their homework. Therefore, I'm, I'm rushing so much to make sure that this year we would complete our work on the European level, that after this first package on security of supply, we will deal with energy efficiency in the summer, uh, we will uh, deal with the uh, decarbonization of, of transport and support for research and innovation in the autumn, and before the Christmas break, we will present uh, new electricity market design. Uh, we will revise the directive on uh, uh, renewables. And we will present new proposals on how the Agency for Coordination of European Regulators, the famous ACER, should uh, uh, work and how their power should be adjusted uh, to, the, to the new demands. My rush is uh, caused by my sincere desire that once we put all this on the table, we can then ask the member states, and now it's your time. Now it's a time that you will start the public debate with the stakeholders, with your citizens, on what we call national energy and climate plans. Now it's uh, your time to do the homework and, and, and to think collectively within, uh, within your member state how you want to fit in the energy union. What is your level of ambition? Uh, for 2030, how you want to fight climate change, how you want to prepare your industry for this fourth industrial revolution. And we know that this would require difficult decision, difficult debate. Therefore, we would like that member states would start to draft the, the national energy and climate plans already next year. So when the term of uh, this commission and the European Parliament uh, will come uh, to a close uh, in 2019, and this is the answer to Enrico's question, how I would like uh, uh, to conclude my term. I would like to conclude it in a way that uh, this legal framework I was describing you on the European level would be not only proposed, but approved by the member states and the European Parliament. And on top of it, we would have 28 national uh, energy and climate plans which click together, which are well interconnected, which reflect the European ambition which reflect uh, the need for the regional uh, cooperation and which would make sure that uh, we in Europe uh, cannot only uh, study the fourth industrial revolution, but that we will be actively building Europe 4.0. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sefkovic, uh, Vice President of the European Commission. We have now a good deal of time for uh, questions and answers, and I expect that they will be numerous, uh, uh, but there is always uh, you know, a moment of uh, uh, disarray at the beginning, so I've uh, pre-cooked uh, the outcome asking uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the first question uh, from um, Dominique. Please. Yes, uh, so Mr. Vice President, first of all, we're very delighted to have you here uh, because you serve as an important inspiration to all students of international energy and Euro European affairs sitting in this room. Uh, as the English would say, uh, you are an old head on young shoulders, uh, <laughs> gi given the fact that you have become a commissioner in the age of 42 or 43, uh, which is a manifestation to all of us sitting here that once one has the ambitions and the skills, they can rise up the career ladders uh, pretty fast. Uh, but regarding my question, Charles de Gaulle, every time he used to face difficulties uh, uh, with managing his state, would ask himself, how can one manage a state uh, with 350 different kinds of cheese? Uh, my question for you is, 
um, how do you create a unified energy market uh, system out of 28 different national silos? Uh, by this I mean uh, the choice of uh, states' energy mixes, uh, energy taxation, public and private ownership issues are remain prerogative regalien of the state, uh, which means that states use these policies as tools of domestic, social, or industrial policy. So, well, we, we may begin here. Very good. Uh, might as well end here. That's well. Excellent. I, I have to say that the question was cooked quite well. And, <laughs> And, and I also have to have to tell you that unfortunately I'm, I'm not the youngest person in the room anymore. I, it took me a while to get uh, to get to get uh, to get used to it. But now, if you go to the Baltic countries, if you are not prime minister 35, the case is lost. You know. So, so, <laughs> and I think Enrico was also one of the youngest, the youngest uh, prime minister. And, and now I think this is the the, the tendency that. Uh, uh, the, the, the political life is, 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 is very uh, demanding. I mean, the new cycle uh, is of 24 hours. Uh, you are dealing permanently with the, with the crisis. So, I mean, it really takes a lot from you. And you need a lot of, a lot of positive energy to be, uh, to be on top of it. And, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, good luck for you guys. You will be young uh, in very important uh, positions. And once you've been there for a while, you will, I'm sure that you will remember my, my, my words. And if it comes to the, to the cheeses and mixes, and uh, of course uh, that's, uh, that's, that's true, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the challenge. And uh, therefore we've been also very careful how we would frame and how we would approach uh, the Energy uh, Union project because we wanted to have it as inclusive as possible. Because uh, I think at first in... Uh, uh, such a delicate areas where the national reflexes are, are very strong and, 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 and rightly so, you need uh, to proceed gradually. You need to show at every step uh, that this is uh, bringing lots of advantage to the member states, that uh, there is a lot to gain, that the economies of scale, synergies, the advantages are very clearly outweighing the, 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 the possible, uh, possible uh, negative uh, concerns. And, and uh, in this particular area, of course, it's not always easy because when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, Tony Blair uh, came to, to see us in the commission and, and we had a coffee together, so he told me that, look, if I, if I look at uh, the energy portfolio these days, and it was like, uh, like a year ago, and, uh, uh, that, uh, and when, I, when I follow the, the debates, very often the discussions on, on uh, energy security reminds me the debate uh, uh, among the defense ministers. And uh, therefore, uh, this uh, uh, segment and the sector is, is so sensitive for, for, the, for the member states that uh, you have to handle it very carefully. So therefore, uh, we are, of course, working uh, uh, with uh, the member states, with the European Parliament, in, in very open manner. We do not want to surprise them. We are, uh, we are measuring everything. We are making impact assessment on every measure we, we, we proposed. Uh, we consult, and we are trying to, uh, to get their support by practical demonstration how useful this could be, what, it would do, be, what uh, this would do to the security of supply how uh, more efficient uh, uh, we would uh, be if we act as one, as it was proven in the Paris climate talks, where Europe was really playing a uh, uh, leading, leading role, and, and uh, uh, that leading role would not be possible to play for any of our member states, being the big states like Germany uh, or, or UK, if it wouldn't be um, Done under under the European flag of uh, biggest economy, which went through the through the through the through the most uh, uh, imp impressive uh, process of decoupling, which I was uh, uh, describing just a few moments ago, and uh, therefore what we are now uh, uh, trying to do is to make sure that despite the national mixes, uh, despite the fact that. Uh, uh, that energy is shared competence uh, with more competencies uh, on uh, the or in the hands of national governments. We are trying to create the framework within which uh, the European synergies and European cooperation will clearly bring a lot of uh, a lot of benefits. And uh, and the good thing is that uh, we have big support uh, for the citizens because they want to see lower energy prices and cleaner environment. But we, of course, we have also big support from the industry. 
because uh, they are telling me uh, the stories how different uh, uh, the, the the taxation across the member states, how complicated it is to uh, to use actually the advantages of European single market because of different energy policies. And I know that we cannot resolve it from one day into another, but we need uh, to have um, this plan. We need to uh, work on the common uh, uh, common energy and climate framework. So we would gradually go to the. Uh, to the European energy mix with, of course, national specificities which would bring much more advantages uh, to the member states like uh, that uh, uh, pursue of the national policies which I think uh, uh, came uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the situation where it's demonstrated mostly by very complex uh, price structure and very high uh, prices for the end users. Yes. Oh, there, there, you have a mic. Introduce yourself and ask. No? Now, yes. No, I can't say it without the micro. Oh, okay. No, no. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Sebastian. Um, and uh, I have a question uh, regarding the security uh, of energy because we were talking about um, the security for 28 member states uh, for energy. So my question is, what will be the role of Russia um, and how inclusive is this solution for geopolitical reasons? I mean, um, shouldn't it be a better solution to try to increase interdep interdependence between uh, the EU and Russia and other players in this region? Uh, what, is your, uh, what is your opinion on that? Thank you very much for that question. Yeah, I was uh, talking about the EU member states, uh, but uh, if it comes uh, to the energy union, I said it already uh, several times that if it comes to the energy union, that uh, uh, this one doesn't stop at the EU borders. I mean, and, and why I'm saying so, because you see this enormous uh, uh, desire from the energy community countries, which are more or less the, the, the neighboring countries to the east, but also, also Western Balkan countries and also countries from the Mediterranean basin, uh, countries like Norway. Uh, to uh, to cooperate uh, to cooperate with us, and we very much welcome it because if it comes uh, to, for example, electricity trading or to some uh, um, uh, potential power uh, shortage uh, problems, of course they do not stop at uh, uh, at our borders, and therefore it's much better if you can work with your uh, with your neighbors on the common network codes. If you can work uh, with your neighbors and try to make sure that they are following similar principles or, uh, or similar law to what you have uh, within the EU. And I have to say that uh, this, this is very much welcomed by, by all these countries and therefore we are working with all of them on the energy union. If it comes uh, to Russia, of course, uh, this is our uh, big energy partner. It was, it is and it will be. And uh, we go through a rather complicated uh, period right now. And I think that we are interdependent already and uh, that uh, we are working on many of the um, energy issues on some with uh, uh, quite uh, some success. And I have to say that when we've been negotiating this trilateral gas protocol between Ukraine, Russia and uh, the, the, the European Union, that this has been quite uh, difficult negotiations, but uh, we, we managed to secure two even last winters, which was not that uh, easy as, uh, as, it, as it seems. We managed to secure adequate financing for Ukraine. We managed to, to agree on the, on the conditions, how the gas would be supplied, and how the, uh, what, would be, what would be the conditions, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and what my wish would be, if we can extrapolate that positive experience and, and that uh, positive spirit which we had on these negotiations, even though they've been very, very difficult, uh, for the larger, uh, for the, for the la larger, larger perspective. Because, of course, if it comes uh, uh, to Russia, uh, they are um, biggest uh, energy uh, exporter to Europe. In some months and, and weeks, uh, the Norway takes over, but uh, I mean, there are two uh, principal, principal uh, suppliers. And th therefore, I think it's uh, just uh, very natural expectations from uh, European side that uh, we just simply want, uh, uh, as a major customer, client, uh, to get good service, 
to get a fair price and uh, to make sure that if the business is done on European territory, that European laws are respected, as our companies are respecting Russian laws when they are doing their business in Russia. And uh, we know that in our mind it was not always the case. Therefore, the DG competition is not conducting uh, these, these in investigations because there are three particular areas uh, in, uh, in the pricing, in uh, uh, banning of the resales of gas in uh, some infrastructure project where we still have a doubt that this was the case and uh, where we are looking uh, for, for some remedies. And because of that experience and because of the difference of price, which I was just referring to a, a few moments ago, what, what we want uh, uh, to make sure is uh, that we have the framework and we have the, we have the rules uh, in Europe respected in a way that uh, uh, we would have uh, at first, the, the comprehensive energy security for all member states, be it on the west, on the east, on the north, on the south, and that we would have uh, a comparable uh, a fair uh, energy pricing. And these are the, the, the issues which uh, we debate, uh, we discuss, uh, and uh, that would be also, I would say, the matter uh, of, the, of the future uh, developments of the EU-Russia relationship and what I'm trying to say that uh, less politics uh, in uh, this debate uh, more trade is usually done I just came from Norway uh, which is exporting more or less the, the the same same volumes and Russia have you ever heard about any problems we had with Norway supplies with any problems with any any law with any problem with the pricing nothing like that happened because it's based on mutual advantages spaces it based on on transparency and in, in based on on very clear legal principles and that's something what i think should be uh, uh should be uh, uh in in uh, in in the interest of, of europe and russia because for sure we will uh, we will remain two very important energy partners thank you down there yeah Stand up that we can see you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you very much for your exhaustive presentation. You mentioned several times the role of Central and um, Eastern European countries in the energy union. Um, I wanted to ask you about, about your vision and about your predictions of the Balkan gas hub. What are the further requirements that it would take for it to be, to be implemented? and how uh, it would ideally contribute to the energy union. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I guess you would be from, from Bulgaria, and <laughs> because every Bulgarian knows everything about the gas hub, and, and, I was and, and I was particularly pleased that you said exhaustive and not exhausting presentation. So I, 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 very, much, I very much appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, the Bulgarian, Bulgarian uh, Balkan gas hub. One of my uh, first uh, lunches, which I uh, uh, organized in this uh, in this new position, uh, was the lunch with the energy ministers from the so-called South Stream uh, project countries. Because you know that the situation was uh, such that we had our legal doubts. We've been we've been stuck. Uh, the, the, there was. Uh, tensed atmosphere around this, uh, this project. So I, I invited these ministers just to, as, as a newcomer just to listen to them, what they think, what we should do, and how to, how to approach this, uh, uh, this issue. And it was on Tuesday, uh, and uh, I think 8 or 9 of December, and in the morning we received the news that uh, it was announced uh, that the South Stream project is cancelled. You can imagine that lunch. It was just amazing. You know, everybody was uh, very much perplexed. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of course, investment been made here and there. A lot of plans been uh, been already uh, uh, finalized. So it was like a big, big shock for the, especially for South uh, Southeast Europe, and. This country has been genuinely concerned how the energy security uh, would be uh, would be guaranteed uh, in in the future, and um, then the uh, president uh, Juncker told me, fly to Sofia, uh, discuss uh, this issue with uh, with uh, with the people from the from the from the region, and let's let's try to invent some some strategy how we can how we can help uh, this region. 
So we did exactly that, and uh, what I was very glad that uh, we managed very quickly to create the so-called high-level group where our countries from the region, uh, from European Union, but also from Western Balkans, but also Ukrainians and also uh, Moldovans. And what we concluded in the end was that we should, in the future, be sure that we would rely much more on ourselves and not to wait for some mega projects to take care of all our worries. That what we need in Europe is actually a series of the small workplace uh, strategic interconnectors, which would make our, our systems much better interconnected, which would make sure that each country would have access to different uh, uh, energy supplies, as we said, to at least uh, three. And let's look at the map. What interconnectors do we miss? What interconnectors do we need? And how we can help them to build them as fast as possible, also with the help of European financing. And this is what we've been doing over the last spring and in the summer. I'm very glad to say that we had an agreement on, uh, on these 14 uh, key projects which are uh, now putting in, uh, in place. And of course, for, for Bulgaria, uh, uh, one of the key priorities was uh, that uh, uh, Varna, because of its uh, uh, ge geostrategic uh, location and because of the plans which we already made, would become the, the Balkan gas hub. And we said that we support uh, the, the creation of the gas hubs in Europe and especially in this part uh, uh, of uh, the European Union because we see that the market there is not liquid, that there is not enough of the, of the trading, of the, of, the, of the movement of the, uh, of the energies of the, of the gas. What do you need for that? Of course, uh, you need for that to be well interconnected. Therefore, Bulgaria is now a major benefactor of the projects of the common interest. We are supporting the development of the interconnector with Greece, with Romania, uh, with Serbia, there is one project for the inner, uh, inner, uh, inner system, uh, gas system of, uh, of Bulgaria. And then, of course, you need uh, proper legislation. You need, you need to have uh, uh, the secure supply of gas from, from different uh, sources. Uh, and in that case, you can, you can run the, the gas hub. So this is what uh, uh, we are uh, now trying to accomplish together with our Bulgarian friends and uh, to do, I would say, things on a step-by-step -step basis. And of course, the first thing is to make sure that the interconnectors are in place, legislation uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is adjusted, and of course, we are working on the uh, needed uh, supplies uh, of energy to Bulgaria and to this region. Yes. Uh, yes. Hello, my name is Maria. And I'm Russian. <laughs> uh, so I have more practical questions. Still, I can't understand how uh, you're going to deal with long-term contracts with, for example, Russia in the European Union. How you're going to, uh, is it going to be some unique price? Because there are some di different commercial relations and uh, some special prices for some countries. How are you going to manage that? And uh, still, if you can uh, tell more about pricing, just the general uh, approach to that, uh, it, it, it would be very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Of course, now what's happening with the, with the, with the gas, I think it, it reminds me of the uh, developments we have seen uh, with oil before oil became global commodity. So now, uh, I think if you, if you look at the price of oil, you usually do not check your, your long-term contract, but you switch on the CNN or Bloomberg, and you see how the, how the oil is being, being traded at these most important global, global stock exchanges. And I think that with the arrival of the, of, the, of the LNG, with that flexibility which LNG offers, that you can actually uh, decide it uh, uh, on, a, on a momentarily basis that, okay, this ship goes there or the ship uh, goes in another uh, direction because you have that, uh, that flexibility and within a couple of days uh, these huge supplies of, of gas arrives more or less at any, any place uh, in the world. I think we would see also that the gas would more and more uh, become global commodity. What would be the decisive uh, pricing uh, uh, pricing mechanisms as, as I see it because there is no conclusive uh, uh, argument on this. I think that uh, in Europe definitely uh, we would see more and more importance of gas hub pricing. 
because uh, it's already seen today that uh, the prices from uh, Barb Gartner or prices from, from uh, uh, British or, or uh, Netherlands uh, uh, gas hubs are, are, are quite determined for what is seen as a, as a price for gas in Europe. So uh, I think in a medium term we would see some kind of hybrid uh, uh, contracts where you would have uh, probably uh, still for those who, who prefer uh, long-term contracts, but I think that the element of, of price would be uh, covered by the gas hub pricing. So maybe it would be it would be this would be the contracts about places of delivery, expected volumes, and um, and some maybe take or pay clauses or something like that. But I think pricing more and more would be would be affected by or or influenced or impacted by the gas hub pricing. But I think that you will see. That more and more of, of, of a gas would be just traded, bought and sold uh, through through the through the ha ga gas hub through the through the sto through this uh, gas uh, stock exchanges. So that that is something which, of course, uh, uh, still uh, would be uh, under the under the evolution because these long-term prices, uh, uh, I think, been very important, especially when there was a need of a new infrastructure build-up. That of course, if you're going to build the big infrastructure, wanted to know that uh, uh, how that investment into the infrastructure would be paid back. But once uh, the infrastructure uh, infrastructure is built, of course, you still need to maintain it. But it's uh, something different than 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 uh, uh, the inclusion of the whole cost in in the infrastructure build up. And on top of it, we in Europe, as you know, we have unbundled mechanisms. So those who uh, those who transport. Uh, uh, the, the gas uh, shouldn't own it, and so on and so forth. So, therefore, the uh, the, the market should should work on this principle. So, that would be my guess how this would evolve in the future. I'm sorry, like a little uh, thing yeah. about the, those forty percent that you are like arguing now. Now that uh, you can't take the forty percent of. I think I'm speaking quite loud. <laughs> I'm loud. Yeah. Uh, so you like. Yeah, recording. Uh, you understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, like this 40% that you said that it's not, um, it's not, it doesn't concern Russia uh, on the European market. What did you mean? Because I uh, can you repeat it, please? It's like about this 40% yes. that you are like you can't uh, be monopolist, monopolistic from what I understood on the, the market within. You mean commercial market. contracts? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. it's, yeah. So yeah. You, but you said it, it, didn't, it doesn't concern Russia, right? It's not aimed like because I read it today in the news, <laughs> and I want to like uh, ask about um, will will you still be uh, dealing with this um, monopoly thing and how you gonna uh, why this forty percent doesn't concern Russia? Can you just yeah uh, yeah I think I think if I understand your your question correctly, you are you are asking about. Uh, the transparency proposal uh, which we are going to present uh, tomorrow on uh, the commercial contracts where we are where we are suggesting that if there is a long term contract which is uh, longer than one year and if under this long term contract uh, you get uh, the supply for one supplier uh, for more than 40% of your market that uh, we want uh, that such a contract would be automatically notified to the European Commission. Why we want that? Because uh, we need uh, uh, to have a, a better uh, understanding how uh, these uh, markets uh, uh, would perform, especially in the um, uh, critical uh, situation. Uh, probably you heard uh, about uh, the stress tests, which are done in such a way that you have to take into account uh, n minus one scenario. What I mean by that is that you that what would happen if this principal supplier would have a problem? That suddenly that contract, which is supplying more than 40% uh, uh, of your energy consumption, cannot be met, cannot be fulfilled. What you what you would do then? And therefore. We want to know better what are the what are the, uh, the the parameters of that contract, so we can prepare much better contingency planning for the concrete member states and for the for the uh, for the concrete regions. And uh, it affects uh, mostly Central Eastern European countries. It affects Finland and it affects, if I remember correctly, also also uh, Portugal because of the supplies from uh, uh, from Ar Algeria. We have a question here. Then down there, then one here. So, speed it up. 
Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I'm from the States, actually. But my question has to do with the incentive to build infrastructure within the EU, because it's something that people talk a lot about, especially with regards to the evolution of gas hubs and a competitive market. As we see the gas market moving more towards flexible ideas with LNG, and this, how, do you, how does the EU intend to encourage infrastructure projects if there's no incentive with long-term contracts? Okay. Um, we should take more. Let's or? take two. Uh, my question actually relates to uh, what Elizabeth said. My name is Ivo. Um, I was wondering, many investors are seeing the European market as a stagnating market. Is it? As a stagnating market, demand is not growing, it's decreasing. And um, uh, what is your vision on the future of the European market? Are we going to continue decreasing gas demand, for instance, in power stations, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? And uh, how do you envision attracting investment if the market isn't as attractive as other global markets in terms of demand? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, I really think that uh, uh, the European market uh, for energy is very uh, attractive because we are the biggest energy importer uh, in, in, in the world. And as I said, we pay more than 1 billion euros every day for energy imports and there is nobody else like us who actually have these energy needs and, 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 and pays uh, so much. Uh, therefore, I think more uh, we invest uh, in the infrastructure to have actually the liquid markets uh, more easier it would be for the traders uh, to 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 trade uh, to trade uh, the gas and that's of course one of the motivation why this infrastructure should be built but i should have start with uh, one which i think it's most important fact for uh, the future uh, discussion on our gas and infrastructural needs uh, and this is how much gas we would need in 2030 so we took into uh, account uh, all our climate policy goals, 27% of energy being produced by renewables, 27% uh, uh, plus, we are thinking about 30% and do impact assessment on a higher percentage as well in the field of energy efficiency and 40% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So we put all this into the models and we, and we, and we took 10 different uh, uh, modeling uh, uh, modeling schemes. The result is uh, that, uh, and our our estimate with which we are working is that by 2030 we would need between 380 to 450 billion cubic meters, which is roughly the same what we are consuming right now. I think the last year we consumed 408 billion billion cubic meters. Then, of course, the question is question is why, and uh, of course. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, NGOs uh, thinks that we are overestimated uh, uh, this uh, gas consumption, but we are telling them that we expect that uh, uh, that we would uh, be in Europe replacing more and more coal with the gas because gas uh, uh, emits 50% less uh, greenhouse gases than uh, than than coal or, or 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 heavy heavy oils. That we expect that more gas would be used in shipping, in uh, in in heavy heavy lorries and and and, and trucks. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that uh, modern uh, gas power station could play the very important uh, role of reserve uh, energy uh, supplies for intermediate sources of energy like wind and solar. So that's our assumption. And I think now, of course, uh, uh, we have to look how to make sure that uh, that volume of gas is, is distributed to where, where it is needed, that we have this liquidity and that interconnection in, in, in the market, uh, which would make the, our supplies uh, in Europe uh, uh, sustainable. And uh, for that, we uh, draw up the, the list of uh, more than 190 infrastructural projects. They are called projects of the common interest. Roughly half goes for electricity and half uh, goes for gas. In, in most cases, uh, uh, in most cases, they are commercially viable. So we we are uh, uh, talking with the regulators, we are talking with the market operators, we are talking with the with the with the, with the governments, and we are establishing the uh, the cases for the market uh, operators to go and and uh, invest. Very often, they need that. I would say administrative assistance from the national government and European side, because in Europe uh, it takes us still uh, around 11 years to build an interconnector. And it's not European bureaucracy this time. These are just simply different laws, different uh, 
uh, financial expectations, different different rules, different network codes, and things like that. So we simply need to make sure that uh, that that administrative burden is minimized or removed as much as possible, so the uh, so the the infra interconnectors are built much much faster. But then you would have a situation where uh, it's not that easy to establish the the commercial case from the from the first site, and we have seen some of such a projects also in, in our Baltic regions. And then I, I, I would just quote uh, uh, one colleague of mine who said that, uh, that uh, uh, with some interconnectors, it's like with the military airports. It's not commercially viable, but you still need it. And in, uh, in that case, what do you do? Of course, uh, uh, we are trying to be as cost efficient as, as, as possible. And then uh, once we establish what kind of interconnector do we need, we are looking for the uh, joint financing where the European Commission can use its own funds, where we are using Juncker Investment Funding, uh, which is uh, supported by the EIB, and where also regulators have to assess uh, how much of that cost they can pass on the tariff so that, uh, so that uh, the price increase in the end would not be unacceptable. So it's rather complex uh, 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 process and this we do on a project by uh, project uh, basis but so far I have to say if it comes to the crucial infrastructure I wouldn't say that the financing was the major problem the major problem was uh, the I would say administrative and sometimes let's use the word uh, bureaucratic burden which is uh, which is linked with the building up of these interconnectors we have one last question here yeah. but we need the mic Hello, um, I'm from Australia, a country which is on track to become one of the world's largest LNG exporters. Uh, you also alluded to the United States and Canada, which have seen huge expansions in LNG supply and the unreliability of existing European supplies. Um, what do you see as the main impediments to increasing trade with non-European uh, energy partners? Mm. Thank you very much for that question. Yes, I was uh, sitting next to your energy minister in this pre-COP21 meeting here in, uh, in, in uh, Paris, and I remember very well that he very proudly stated that before 2020, Australia would, would be the biggest uh, LNG exporter. And, uh, and I think that we see already what, what's happening with the, with the, with the, with the competition uh, right now. I think that there will be fierce competition between Australia and Middle East suppliers like, like Qatar for supplying uh, Asian, uh, Asian uh, markets. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think we see uh, more ships uh, from, from Qatar and Middle East uh, actually pro, uh, uh, sailing toward the European, uh, European uh, direction. And I think that we have already the uh, first uh, ship with the crude oil um, uh, landing in Marseille. We, we saw the first uh, Qatari LNG in the uh, northern part uh, of Europe. And I think that we see that uh, this new global uh, supply chain is, is being formed. Uh, so I don't think that uh, there are currently right now some, uh, some kind of administrative uh, impediment. Uh, the major obstacle was the ban of the US Congress to export crude oil and LNG, which was, uh, which was, which was then treated by licensing. And now this ban was, uh, uh, was removed. So we have these three very important uh, uh, countries with lots of capacity uh, to bring new supplies uh, to the to the global market, so I don't think that we have uh, uh, some administrative uh, barriers right now. What we feel in Europe that what our problem is is still not well connected infrastructure. That is the issue which we will uh, propose tomorrow. How to settle? We try to be very practical about it. We think that what we need is. Uh, 10 uh, infrastructural projects, all of them would be, would be sensitive because we have a big capacity in Spain, but we do not have enough interconnectors with the, with the rest of continental Europe. I mean, we have big demand in, in Western Balkans, but we still do not have LNG in Croatia, in, in, in Kirk. We have, uh, we built uh, the, the, the Klaipeda terminal, but we still need some additional interconnectors among these countries so that uh, that uh, uh, market would be much more liquid. So I think that uh, um, what would be, of course, uh, very important would be how the 
price competition would evolve between pipeline gas and, and LNG gas. And when I was checking the prices yesterday, they've been very close to each other. Uh, but I think now we will we will see uh, the the competition uh, being uh, being increased, and uh, Europe can uh, benefit uh, from this uh, new competition only if uh, we would prepa prepare ourselves for this from the point of view of, uh, of infrastructure and uh, uh, readiness to, to use this uh, new type of fuel. Yes, thank you very much. If I can say one uh, word uh, at the end, uh, one of the problems of uh, energy debates, and you have to do a lot of debating, you're going around and preaching the energy union and selling the energy union, uh, one of the problems is that frequently people do not understand all the technicalities. Uh, there is a lack of uh, understanding and education in this field. So uh, thank you very much. And here you have uh, a group of uh, young professionals who uh, come out of here with a very good understanding of all the energy problems and are, will be helpful for you <laughs> for uh, uh, explaining how important the goal of the energy union is for the future of Europe. I can Thank also you. tell you that some of the questions been much more difficult than I got at the hearing. So I think that you are very well trained well, and we are very much looking forward to have you among the or European yeah. or international professionals. Thank That's you very what much. We Thank feel you. all the time.